Welcome to Let's Talk Micro. Hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of Let's Talk Micro. I hope you have a great week. Like always remember that Let's Talk Micro is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, TuneIn Radio, Overcast, Stitcher, Pandora, Amazon Music. Wherever you listen to your podcasts, you can find Let's Talk Micro. I am also on Instagram as Let's Talk Micro, no apostrophe. And I am also on Twitter as Let's Talk Micro 1. So go ahead and follow. I always like to post pictures of organisms. On the last episode, we went over the LIA test or the lysine iron agar test. So this test is used to differentiate gram negative rods based on the decarboxylation or deamination of lysine and the formation of hydrogen sulfide. So I kind of I compared it to the TSI. There are some similarities and there are some differences. They are both slanted agar. They have two parts. The, the tilted portion is called the slant and then the bottom portion is called the butt. You inoculate both tests the same way. You stab the butt and then you streak the slant. So as you're going downward, once you start pulling out your needle, then you streak your slant. If there is glucose fermentation on the butt, so both tests, they have glucose on the butt. If there is fermentation, the end color is yellow. However, this time, uh, they have different pH indicators. You have for your TSI or triple sugar iron, you have um, phenol red as your indicator of acid production. You know, when there's fermentation, acid is produced, the pH is lower, and then you get the color change. Well, on the LIA test, you have bromocresyl purple as your pH indicator. Now, with the LIA, there's a, different, there's a difference, which is that even though this test, you know, it has, it detects the fermentation of glucose by that color change. However, this test is designed for the deamination and the decarboxylation of lysine. So if the organism, you know, decarboxylates lysine, then there's a product form, which is called cadaverin. And this is going to change the color of the butt back to purple. So the media, the original color of the media is purple. So it changes to yellow if there's fermentation, but if there's decarboxylation, it changes back to purple because of the cadaver. So that's the difference right there. And I talked about lysine. You know, lysine is an amino acid. It's part of the, the protein buildup. You know, very important proteins for our bodies. So that was one difference. So then decarboxylation occurs on the bottom or the butt. And then deamination occurs on the top, the slant. And that is, uh, it's detected by a burgundy color. So burgundy for deamination, purple color for decarboxylation. Just like the TSI, you read it slant over butt. And we use the same terms. A for acid, so if you have the yellow color, and K for alkaline, the purple color. And I also talked about some reactions like Citrobacter frondi, K, K with H2S, Proteus mirabilis, red slant over acid butt, R, A, and Salmonella species, K over K with H2S. So now if you, if you get quizzed, about the lysine iron agar test or LIS. Now you know what's this test used for, what the reactions look like, how does the test work. So on today's episode, I want to go over the urease test. Urease. So this test is used to determine the organism's ability to produce the enzyme urease, which hydrolyzes urea. It is an agar test. And how does it work? Well, let's start first talking about what does the agar has. So it has urea, and we have our phenol red friend again as a pH indicator. 
So let's get a little technical. So what's urea? Well, urea is the product of decarboxylation of amino acids. When urea is hydrolyzed, ammonia and CO2, or carbon dioxide, are produced. Then ammonia brings the medium to an alkaline pH. The medium contains phenyl red, like I said, which in an alkaline pH of 8.1, the medium changes to a magenta color. So organisms that rapidly produce urea, they change the medium within 24 hours. And I have seen it in less time. So the medium is turned pink. Weak producers may take several days to change. And organisms that are negative for this test, that they do not hydrolyze urea, they do not produce any color. So let's do a short recap. So the agar has urea and phenol red as the pH indicator. And I said that urea is the product of the decarboxylation of amino acids. So if the organism produces this enzyme called urease, it will hydrolyze urea. So when this happens, CO2 and ammonia are produced, and then ammonia brings the pH to an alkaline level. So when phenol red, when the pH is 8.1, it's going to change to a magenta color or a hot pink color. It's very beautiful. I mean, if you've seen it, those of you that work in the clinical lab, at some point in time you have done urea. So it's definitely a very nice color. So what does this agar look like? Well, guess what? It's also a slanted auger. But in this case, there's a difference. When you inoculate it, you're just going to streak the slant. There's no stabbing. So maybe you're thinking, why not? Why not stab it? Why just the slant? Well, it's very easy. You're using the, the butt like as a control. So basically, you're seeing the color change on the top. And you want to make sure that so your your bottom is the negative control. So you leave it alone. That way you know what a negative looks like. And make sure that there's nothing nothing changes on that. So it's a QC. So it's very easy. You streak the slant. And then you inoculate it at 35 to 37 degrees in a non-CO2 incubator. As I was mentioning... You know, organisms like their rapid urease producers, they can change that medium within 24 hours. And now that I mentioned the incubation temperature, 35 to 37 degrees in a non-CO2 incubator, some organisms, you know, they, they produce it so strongly that I have seen it turn at room temperature. But follow your procedure, of course. You always want to get optimal results. But yeah, these very strong urease producers, they can change it at room temperature. And I have definitely seen that. So what's, what's the use of this test in the clinical lab? I mean, what do we need it for? Well, you know, it has several purposes. You can use it for different things. And one thing that's going to be different here, since I've been talking about the TSI, triple sugar iron, and the LIA, lysine iron agar, you see how I always like to repeat the names. You know, it reinforces retention. So with the TSI and the LIA, we've been we use it for gram negative rods. Now with the urea test, the urea agar, we can use it for more than gram negative rods. And I will get to that shortly. So we've been talking about gram negative rods. So how is this test useful? For gram negative rods. Well, let's talk about the group that we love, the Enterobacteriales or Enterobacteriaceae as they used to be known. So, in this group, you can use it to aid in the identification of produce. Produce is urease positive. You can also use it to differentiate between different Enterobacteriales. For example, a classic example. I mean, and nowadays with the Molotov, it's the, it's a little bit easier. But let's say that you have, you set up a gram negative ID card on your Vitec, and it comes back as a low discrimination between Klebsiella pneumoniae 
and Enterobacter aerogenes, which is now called Klebsiella aerogenes. So those of you that worked in a lab at some point in time and, and have Vitec um, know what I'm talking about. So with this low discrimination, which is, so let's, let's stop there for a second. So when a Vitec, the Vitec instrument, which is used for identification and susceptibilities, when it gives you a low discrimination, it's that it has some questionable reactions that it cannot decide for one organism. So it's kind of stuck between two, three, and it gives you the percentages. And it tells you what reactions do you need to differentiate between both or you know, two, three organisms. So with Klebsiella pneumoniae and Enterobacter aerogenes or Klebsiella aerogenes, one of the tests that it tells you when it gives you that low discrimination is to perform the urea test. Klebsiella pneumoniae, it's urease positive. And Enterobacter aerogenes or Klebsiella aerogenes, it's urease negative. So you can perform that test and then you can differentiate. I mean, it all depends on what kind of lab do you work on. Like I said, with the Molotov, if you get that presentation on the Vitec, you can just load it on the Moldy and it will give you an ID. I mean, it can take up to 24 hours for that color change. So depending on what time in your shift you are, if the next shift doesn't read cultures, you might have to think what to do. But that's typically what it, you know, what it aids for your enterobacteriales. So that's one of the uses that we have for this test with the gram-negative rounds. And like I mentioned, we can use this test for more than gram-negative rounds. So we can also use it for gram-positive rounds. So how is this test useful for gram-positive rounds? Well, I'm going to tell you a bench that it comes in handy, the urine bench. Normally, some species of coronabacterium, they tend to be non-pathogenic, so we we tend to refer to them as skin flora, you know, especially in the urine bench. There are some species like Coronibacterium diphtheria, Coronibacterium jacum, that they're pathogenic. Some of the other ones, they can be pathogenic depending on the source, like striatum. But overall, you have this group of Coronibacterium species that they're called the diphtheroids, and they're non-pathogenic. Where in the urine bench, there is one species of Coronibacterium that is strongly associated with UTIs or urinary tract infections. This is called, can you guess? It's called Corinebacterium urealyticum. Corinebacterium urealyticum. So it's definitely associated with UTIs. So a lot of species of Corinebacterium, they're actually urease negative, but this one is urease positive. So if you're working on the bench, and you have a pure growth of coriniform gram-positive rods, this will be a helpful test. You know, also, you have to keep in mind the morphology of it. Now, I'm not saying that it's exclusive. We can see atypical presentations of organisms, but normally, like those corinobacteria that, they call, that we call the dipteroids, you know, they tend to be large, white colonies, round colonies. So with Corinobacterium urolyticum, they tend to be like small, like almost pinpoint. So that's something to keep in mind when you're on the bench. But like I said, you can have atypical presentations. But overall, your dipteroids are large colonies. So you're definitely concerned about this organism when you start seeing like a pure growth. As you know, urine is sterile, but it comes out of a source that is non-sterile. You have flora. And unfortunately, a lot of times the patients, they don't follow the clean catch cleaning procedures so you end up getting a lot of bacteria there so it looks messy a lot of times and you just say like mix your genital flora when you report it but if you see like this pure growth of gram positive rods you should definitely rule out coronabacterium urolyticum i have rarely seen it in the lab that i've worked on i remember that one time they brought them, you know, sometimes my lab, it can function, it functions as a reference lab for other labs. And one time we received one that they were trying that they couldn't identify it in their lab. 
So they sent it to us, and the source, of course, was urine. And I remember seeing like the little, you know, the little colonies that were so tiny. So we did the urea agar. We stroked the slant. We incubated it. And then next thing you know, you had your magenta color. I mean, of course, it was put on the Vitek to get a, an ID, but it definitely aided in the identification of Coronibacterium urolyticum. So I remember that day. It was a great day. I mean, because we do feel bad for the patients, of course, when you have a serious bacteria. But as far as us microbiologists, we get excited in the sense that we get to see something different, something new. So when we see something unusual, that way we can learn more about it. We can train ourselves and then we can actually, you know, we're able to recognize it the next time. So having all these organisms, it just makes us better at our jobs. And of course, you know, it's, it's sad when the patient has it. So we try to provide a result as soon as possible so the patient can get treatment. So definitely, if you are on the urine bench and you see that pure growth, it's always good to keep it in the back of your mind. You might not see it as much, of course, as you know, in the urine bench, some of the organisms that lead in causing UTIs are E. coli. Of course, you know, you have Klebsiella pneumoniae, you have Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and then as far as your gram-positive cocci, you definitely have... Uh, Enterococcus faecalis, and then you can also have, you know, Aerococcus urinae for the elderly population, Staphylococcus saprophyticus on your uh, young females. So you might not see this as much, but definitely keep it in your mind at some point in time, because you might see it, and then it's good to know this. So you get this organism, get that urea test, you do it, it's positive, and it helps in the identification of it. So we talked about gram-negative runs, gram-positive runs. What else can we use this test for? Well, definitely uh, the urea test, it helps in the identification of brucella. And what is brucella? Well, brucella is an organism that you do not want to see in your lab. You definitely don't. So it's a gram-negative cocobacilli. One of the things that makes it very dangerous is that it's intracellular. So it can go inside your white blood cells. So it's, it's, um, it's oxidase positive and it stains poorly on gram stains. So this is one of those organisms that if, you're, if you suspect it, you should definitely handle it underneath the hood. Do not open it outside. Because it can be transmitted, you know, it can be transmitted by aerosols. So if you get exposed, infection prevention needs to be notified. And they need to put you on medication right away. So it's a serious organism. Brucellosis, which is the disease caused by it, it's a zoonosis. So it's, you know, it's, an, it's transmitted from animals to humans. So you can see it in cattle and sheep, and swine, dogs, and it can be transmitted to humans. And since it's, you know, it can be aerosolized, it can be used in a potential bioterror attack. And this is why in the lab, twice a year, at least I don't know how it works with the other agencies, I don't know what API or the American Proficiency Institute does. But in labs that are CAP regulated, you get a CAP survey, which is basically, so you get a material, you get a sample that you test it like you will normally test a sample in the lab. Just to make sure that everyone is proficient, that you're doing the correct test, that you're getting the correct results. So twice a year, you get this survey with potential, you know, organisms that can be used in, in terror attacks, so in bioterror. So it's typically you get three samples and then you play them, of course, using all the precautions, always under the hood, sealing your plates, putting on whatever you dispose of, like your lubes and other materials, putting them in bleach. 
So Brusella can be one of those. And then you start performing certain tests to rule things in, rule things out. Oh my goodness. Story. I used to work in a small lab. They had no urea. They had very little tests. So when I got the survey, it was very difficult to identify the correct organisms. I mean, using my textbooks and using other biochemicals, I ruled in, ruled out. So I managed to get the correct answers, but it was definitely very challenging. But I digress a little bit. So definitely this urea, it's, it's helpful for the identification of brucella because brucella is urea is positive. So keep that in mind. And I will talk more about brucella and organisms like this down the line. But just remember that it can be used for it. So if you're in the lab, you see a tiny gram-negative cocobacilli that's staining poorly, be careful. But however, like I said, if the physician suspects that the doctor has, that the, not the doctor, the patient has it, they should definitely alert the lab. That way from the moment that that sample arrives, it can be treated with the proper precautions. So we learned a little bit about urea today as we compare with the TSI and the LIA. And of course, you know, I'm comparing because there are some similarities, but they all have different purposes, right? Your TSI, it's for the fermentation of glucose, lactose, sucrose, and H2S production and gas. Your LIA for the decarboxylation and deamination of lysine. And this one for the hydrolysis of urea. But they are all slanted. And then on two of them, TSI, LIA, you do the stab and streak. And then on the urea, you just streak the slant. And remember, you don't stab the butt because that's going to be your control. You want to make sure that you don't get a false positive result. So now you know three tests, two that can be helpful for, well, three that can be helpful for gram-negative rods. And out of those three, one can be helpful for more things, like on the urine bench and for organisms such as brucella. And that, my dear audience, is the end of this episode. I hope you enjoy listening about urea because I definitely enjoyed talking about it. Like always, continue bringing that passion. Continue bringing that motivation. It's so important. We do such an important work. And I know sometimes, you know, it, it, there's not a lot of awareness of what we do. But it's so important. And I think as I go through this podcast, I want to bring people up bring people in that they can go ahead and bring suggestions and see what we can do to bring more awareness to our jobs so important what we do for the providers so continue bringing that passion continue staying safe and of course continue talking micro until the next time